and welcome back to Meeting of the Minds. Today we have a very special show. I am here with Tri Bannock, all three. Lou, Ed, Steve, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you bet. It's our pleasure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So super excited having you on the show. Your, your family name is probably one of the first names that my brothers and I heard from our dad back when we were kids, when we started wrestling. And saw your pictures up on the NCAAs this year dur during the show and everything. They had it during the commercial. So we're real excited to have you on. I wanted to start off talking about your background, growing up with one another. I know a little something about how it is growing up with brothers. What was your experience like with one another, the lessons that you've learned and how it's been together? Yeah, Steve, you want to take that one? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, our, our, uh, our upbringing was, so, was, uh, was, was not normal. Uh, I think that's a, a gross uh, understatement. Um, you know, we, uh, we, we lost our family when uh, Ed and Lou were three and I was four. And we, we, uh, we document this in Uncommon Bonds, The Journey and Optimism, our book. Uh, that we wrote a couple years back. Uh, so we, we, we started out in a kind of fragmented way. Uh, Ed and Lou uh, joined uh, me at uh, our, our, uh, our foster parent home, uh, adoptive parent home uh, when, the, when they were four years old and I had just turned five. And, and from that point forward, we stayed together and uh, grew up in North Jersey. Uh, and then ended up going to school in, uh, in Port Jervis. And we're really fortunate to have, uh, uh, seven uh, teachers, and they just happened to be our, our coaches as well in football and wrestling. Uh, that really took us under uh, you know their wing and, and uh, mentored us. And and uh, and one in particular, Mark Fowler, uh, our high school res wrestling coach, uh, really set the frame for us in, in terms of uh, uh, realizing college as uh, you know a, a real option for us. Uh, and then. Uh, and of course, uh, he was our math teacher and also our wrestling coach at Port Jervis. Just happened to be a little bit bigger than us uh, uh, weight-wise, so he was the the fourth workout partner, which was invaluable for us. Uh, in the fact that uh, you know he was he was a better wrestler than we were at the time. I mean, it's just the uh, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another kind of thing. We had to go on every single day. You don't want to tick him off because he would you know he would try to wail on you. Uh, you know, every day in practice. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but uh, yeah, so we owe a lot to Mark, a uh, phenomenal human being and, and uh, really invested uh, in us, as did the other coaches that we have uh, in, uh, in Port Jervis, New York. Excellent. And now was, was faith a big part of your upbringing? Talk about that. What principles are being passed down? What lessons that were able to form you guys to be so successful in the sport that's so hard. Yeah, you know, I, I, faith was part of it. I mean, when you go on these, uh, the, the chains, the uncertainty that we dealt with every day, and there's, there's this uh, larger uh, thought that you, we always had that there's, there's something more than just this. And, and uh, early on in our lives, I mean, we had that, that central focus that there was, there was something greater and that there were some things that, um, you know, as you get older, you, you think of in this way, there's a journey, there's something ahead of you. And, but the, the concept of having Ed, Steve and I together and really being that, uh, not only feedback loop, but faith loop for each other. We were, we were there uh, continually um, for one another. And, uh, and with, with uh, freedom comes, you know, a lot of things you can get in a lot of trouble, right? And, uh, but faith was always sort of that anchor that brought us back and brought us down that moral path that, you know, let's do the, the right thing. And I think it provided discipline to us to be not only uh, good athletes, but good students and good human beings. So it was early on. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think all of us had that, that sense that there was something more, there is something beyond just the, us. And this journey is, you know, short in life, but uh, you know, at the end, there's a, there's a, a heavenly father that, um, uh, you know, incredible designer of the universe and, and uh, the world and those sort of four years old as they are today. So uh, and that's been that's been the central uh, guardrail for us is that uh, faith. Absolutely. And I look at it having priorities in line and, yeah. and in, in terms of faith, right, right? Everyone says God, country, right? Well, also 
military service. I know that's that's something that's very important to, to the Bannock family. Talk about that country, of, of course, being able to represent the country for the Olympics, service. Um, you know, again, God country, things are in a proper order. You have that perspective that I think you need to have to really be successful and not just successful, but to be fulfilled in life. And I'll, I'll turn that one to Steve because he's got the, uh, you know, he's got the, the 27 year military career, distinguished career and uh, defended our nation um, more than most human beings should have to. And uh, I'll, I'll let Steve take that one because I mean, it's truly an honor to have him as a brother and someone that uh, protected our nation. Yeah, so you, you go back to, uh, you know, 1775 at uh, uh, Lexington and Concord. I mean, uh, our, our, uh, our, our nation, uh, you know, it was, it was birthed by people who are willing uh, to defend something that's pretty important, and that's the United States. And when I say the United States is an idea, uh, you defend the idea of freedom and, and rights for everyone. Uh, and, uh, you know, very early on there, uh, we, we had people who had, who had been oppressed in, in Europe uh, and, uh, and, and wanted something better. I mean, in the, in, the, in the genius that was involved in creating what they created just every day, it blows me away and it's worth fighting for. Uh, you know, it's not free. And, uh, and we have uh, countless uh, service members, uh, you, know, uh, you know, around the world. Um, you know, defending the country uh, in uh, in our, our freedoms and in and, uh, and, and things like that. So, uh, you know, we it, you know it was it, it was interesting. Uh, we got recruited by West Point, which is one hour door to door from Port Jervis. Uh, uh, and uh, West Point coach came up and he was sitting uh, he was sitting at our kitchen table, and had the three of us around there, my mom and dad, and. Uh, uh, Leroy Allitz, Coach Allitz, and uh, Coach said, "Hey, look, you know, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you guys down to West Point. Uh, you know, give you a quarter million dollar education, the best education in the world, and you guys will be off and running, good to go." And of course, that was, you know, 1975, 76 time frame, right? So we're coming out of Vietnam, uh, and you know, at that particular juncture, you know, we had some family members that had gone to Vietnam uh, that they were, were on my dad's side, and. And it just, it just wasn't the time to go into the military at that time. So, you know, I kind of spoke for Ed and Lou and said, you know, we're really probably not going to go into the military, you know, but it goes back to your, your previous comment about God's providence, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, as things would have it, uh, Lou actually joined our ROTC first out at, uh, out at Iowa and, and got me connected with uh, just a, a, a tremendous uh, man in our life, um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mick Bartlemy. And again, you know, uh, the Lord puts people in your life uh, as handrails, and, and you know, and uh, Mick was Mick was that person, and he got Lou in in the uh, in the army, and Lou served uh, three years at uh, at West Point, and then uh, we had uh, you know, all of us, you know, had uh, Major General uh, uh, Casey Lohr, Ken Lohr, 1956 Iowa National Champion wrestler. He was a Brigadier General at the time. And uh, he turned out to be, he's the father of the modern day Rangers. Uh, and uh, he turned out to be my mentor uh, for a number of years. And uh, he directed me on the, uh, into, the, in, into some of the elite units in the Army, the 82nd Airborne Division, and, and, uh, and then the, uh, spent nine years in the Ranger Regiment. Uh, and uh, you know, deployed to six different combat zones and, uh, you know, and participated in four invasions of different countries. And uh, so, uh, when uh, when you think about when you think about the, when I think about the United States, all I think about is giving. What what can I give? Uh, you know how how can, how can I serve my country? Uh, you know I'm back in I'm back in service uh, right now as a as an old broken down airborne ranger civilian guy. Uh, you know running running the uh, running a college for for the military and very fortunate to have the opportunity uh, in uh, in to serve again. So. Uh, yeah, there, there's not there. You know, again, I've been around the world uh, many, many times. Um, there's no better, better place out there than the United States. It's something that, uh, you know, and again, I go back to the idea. It's the idea that we have to protect because it doesn't exist anywhere else. Yep, there's a lot that can be said about that now, this day and age. We won't go off on a tangent, but we'll pray for our country and yep. pray for the preservation of our nation. And of course, on behalf of all of us, thank you very much to the Bannock family for your service. I mean, yeah. 
again, we can't say it enough, proper priorities. We always look at successes. Yes, successful. Yes, um, good people. And yes, happy. It's all three. It's happiness. It's success. It's and that's that stems from that priority order. So, after all that, where did you end up deciding to go to college? Yeah, Ed, why don't you take that one? Because I think you were you were the uh, driver behind that, at least from for I think us. Yeah. Yeah. Did you guys play any sports? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, after my sophomore year in high school, I, that summer I made the uh, junior national team representing New York and I went out to uh, Iowa City, Iowa and wrestled in the freestyle and the Greco-Roman national tournament and I took uh, fourth in the uh, Greco and, and uh, I went two and two in the freestyle but I learned a lot and then the next year my junior year, Lou's junior year and Steve's senior year, we all three made the team, went out there and, and again in Iowa City I only wrestled in freestyle and, and I, I took second that year I think Lou you took third in, uh, no, I didn't, I didn't place. You didn't place it, and I'm not sure if Steve, what he did. But anyway, long story short, we got exposed to Iowa. We got exposed to the style of wrestling that is done on a national level rather than just at, in New York. And in our, Lou and I, our senior year, I went out and I took a third that year. And Lou, what'd you take? No, I Top didn't place. Mm-hmm. You didn't place? Nope. And then, uh, but that got other people. Keep bringing that up. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i thought you placed i thought you took third or something okay anyway long story short that exposure not only taught us how to become better wrestlers but also got coaches interested in recruiting us to go to college and i remember wade chalice recruited steve and, and uh, lou and i got recruited by uh actually john marks was the person at iowa that took an interest to us and, and started talking to us and then talked to gable about hey, you got to recruit these guys. And, and along the way, we you know the the high school national or the high school uh, state tournaments. Uh, I think Dan sent Chris Campbell out one year at I think it was our junior or senior year, and he reports back to Gable, uh, Gene. He goes, "Hey, uh, Gates goes, what what'd you think of the two brothers and their brothers?" And uh, he goes, "Yeah, he goes, you know, they don't know a stitch, stitch a technique, but they got heart." And Dan goes, "I can work with heart." So. Uh, and it was a hard decision uh, because, you know, as Ed mentioned, Steve ended up going over to Clemson. Uh, it was a year ahead of us on a, a full scholarship. And um, that was a, really the beginning of our, you know, where we were being separated from one another. And um, that, that cord that I mentioned earlier got unwound by one thread, but it was a short-lived uh, unwind. And, you know, Steve, what was it, about a year and a half later, maybe two years later that you joined us at Iowa? Yeah, but you know when I I went out after my first year at Clemson, you guys uh, uh, were there at, were there at Iowa, uh, and you know I, I I saw I mean I, I saw that the the best wrestling program in the country, and it was it was a meat grinder. I mean it was uh, I mean it, I mean I really you really can't put into words uh, what uh, what what Gable does with athletes. Uh, it's it's the uh, it's the most unique thing I've seen from, from any, any, any leader or coach, uh, his ability uh, to push people beyond anything they can ever dream of. Uh, and then uh, once he gets them to that point, then, then he's able to really uh, use your, your capability. And he did that. He did that with everybody that was on the team. If you were part of the team, you, you, you experienced it. So, but anyway, I saw, I saw what, what, a, what a meat grinder it was. And I went back to Clemson for, for my, for my second year, and uh, and I, I had made the decision when I left in that summer uh, that I was going to I was going to I was going to get reunited with Ed and Lou, uh, you know, because, uh, ha, you know, I, I just I could I could see the pressure that was uh, that was there and, and how it, it was going to be pretty daunting for both of them uh, to deal with, uh, you know, some of the externalities that are just Iowa wrestling. I mean, again, these these things you really can't articulate. It's just. Uh, I mean, you get, you get, it's, you're, you're in, you're in a room, uh, where it's, uh, you know, literally the best man is, is you know, that day and, 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 and there, you know, the best man that day, it, it, it rotated. Uh, I mean, there's, there's, there, there, you know, the competition was unbelievable. So, uh, I, I decided just to, uh, leave Clemson, drop my scholarship and just walked on at Iowa so I could uh, be there with Ed and Lou. 
to kind of help them, uh, you know, with uh, with some of the stress and and just get reunited. I mean, there's a there's a there's an intangible there about uh, being, you know, the three of us being together and uh, and you know it turned out okay. I would I would add a couple things to uh, the the Iowa experience. I mean, one is you know what played heavily in I think in my mind initially was well here's a team that's already done it. They did it, I believe, in 1975. They did it in '76 again, and then my senior and my senior in 78, they, they did it again. And, you know, in between that year, 76, 78 was the year that, that we really got introduced to Iowa. And we, you know, we said, here's a, here's a team that's already got the formula figured out the, the culture in terms of what's necessary to win. Steve mentioned the workout room. I mean, it was any given day, there was a new, uh, there was a new guy that was kind of king of the hill there. And, um, uh, and so you look at it and say, here's, here's a program that's already done it. Why would we not go to that program? Um, and you know, we're fortunate, and I, and I really spoke about this a couple of weeks ago on a uh, thing with Gable. Gable did a really great job. Like we had in high school, we had really good sponsors and, and mentors, Mark Fowler being probably the preeminent one. But, you know, I would say Jay Robinson, Chuck Yagla, and... Uh, <clears throat> And Mark Johnson did a just a wonderful job complimenting Gable, and, and Gable gave him that space. And to me, that was what the fun part. Ed, you may remember this when we were freshmen. And talk about sponsorship, Dean. So Jay Robinson, it's probably illegal today to do this, but uh, you know Jay would come over to our dorms at five in the morning, and we'd meet him outside. And that was the advent of the Nautilus uh, weightlifting equipment. The only place that had it was Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and, and you know, Jay said, look, I'll drive you guys up there every morning, five o'clock, and we'll do a workout up there. But you got to be getting, you know, I'm not going to come and wake you guys up. You guys got to be ready. And Ed, how long did we do that for? I mean, it was months that we did that. And what a, but, but what a tremendous Nautilus, sacrifice. But the, the Nautilus equipment guys put some down in, in the uh, locker room in Iowa City. I remember that because they finally realized that we were serious. And there was two or three of those down there in, in our locker room. Yeah, but it's just, it speaks to that, that team ethic and the uh, sponsorship that we've been blessed all along our athletic career. And part of it, I think, Gene, is what you guys and you, your brothers also, I mean, if you own it, you step up and take, take responsibility and want to get better, there's lots of people that'll help you in this world. And, uh, you know, fortunately, we didn't have a lot to, to hang on. We, you know, family didn't have a lot of wealth or any wealth. And we had each other. We had some athletic count. We had some pretty good minds about it. And, uh, you know, we stuck together. We're stronger together. And, you know, as Steve mentioned, he joined us out in Iowa. And he's right. I mean, there, there was a lot of pressure as you leave. You're a thousand miles away from home. There's a lot of pressure. And uh, that homesickness never really developed. But it was, you know, there was always that uh, longing, you know, to have the three of us brought back together. And, uh, I'm sure glad it did because, you know, I would say every bit of success I had at Iowa and certainly Ed would probably chime in on this as well is because Steve was, you know, there was, uh, you know, kind of directing us and helping us through tough times. Yeah, the big thing there was that Steve being a year older, he led us. We were being led by our big brother, Steve. And what was interesting is we did, we did meet him at Iowa to make us better. And then once we got there, and then oh, buying into the junior national trip, the junior national tournament three years in a row really taught me a lot about the sport of wrestling and it exposed me to a lot of things that, you know, and Mark Fowler was the impetus behind that. We didn't have the money to go to that. Mark Fowler went out and talked to the businesses and, and got the money necessary for, for me to go out my first year and then Lou and Steve and I the second year and then Lou and I the third year. I mean, it, we owe so much to Mark Fowler and, and all that he and his staff did. It was ridiculous how much they did for us. I mean, it just, we can't repay him, but we can pay forward as, as we do speaking in, in camps and just other things just to help people. Uh, when we're at Iowa, the big thing to me that I, I studied Gable, I studied Robinson, I studied Yagla, I studied Johnson to see how in Mark uh, and then we also had uh, John o. Marks, and I wanted to see what they did, and, and they were real. If you wanted to win, here's what you needed to do. And Jay Robinson said, "Look, it, you want to win nationals, you got to take somebody down, you got to get away from underneath." 
You got to get them out, get out from underneath. You do that, you win nationals. And every day, every practice was working. You were working so that you had a setup shot and finish. So you can take someone down. You were working so that you can get out from underneath, particularly if a, if a person rode with the legs. How are you going to win? What are you going to do? What techniques are you going to employ to make sure you can go out and win the match so that you can get to the finals and win the finals? You know, I, I was talking to a, uh, a runner up at the Nationals uh, here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he's, he's through a family uh, member. He's, he's friends and uh, they're next door neighbors. And I was talking to him and I, and I, and I said, you know, here, and he, like I said, he was a runner up. And I said, you know, here's, here's what I saw. And I said, you know, what's different at the program that you're at versus what you know, Stevie and I went through at Iowa was, I think at Iowa, we played um, uh, chess and not checkers. By that, it's not one move and done. And, and, and that's what I was trying to explain to this young wrestler who had a you know, really nice tournament, but didn't win it. And I said, you, you, you made that one move and you were done. And that was the thing that I and I don't know whether it was maybe six months or a year after Iowa, there wasn't a concept of, well, you know, I'm going to just do this move. Every move was a setup for another move. And that chain wrestling, that, that sense of, you know, you were eight or nine steps deep in terms of what you could do. And you were, and I mentioned this on the Gable thing a few weeks ago, I mean, there was a sense of uh, fearlessness because, you know, whatever position you could, you know, you ended up in, you weren't going to stop. You're just going to keep going. And here's six or seven more steps you're going to go through until you're on top or whether that was what, you know, trying to get out from the bottom, whether you're trying to do leg attacks or upper body and they just float into them. We, and I think that's what we called it flow wrestling or something like that. And, uh, and uh, that was uniquely Iowa though. We, we had a little bit of that in Port Service, but uh, boy, they really took it to a new level at, at Iowa and made us think about continuous wrestling, not one and done. And, and that was the program that I enjoyed part about the program that I enjoyed most is um, we were that type of wrestler. We, we didn't stop after the first move. It, you know, wasn't stopped until you pinned the guy. You know, but the, the other you know, thing but, about the Iowa program was the Hawkeye wrestling club was a new yeah. thing in college wrestling. And that, you, I mean, it would be analogous to college football players practicing with pro football players on a regular basis, how much better are they gonna be? They're gonna be tremendously better. So with the Hawkeye Wrestling Club and the wrestlers they had there in the Iowa room on a regular basis, the Iowa wrestling team had to get better, had to become better wrestlers because of their their day-to-day -day workouts. Yeah, and, I, I, and I said this, uh... You know, when I uh, got had that uh, great honor to uh, speak for Mark Fowler when he got inducted to the Wrestling Hall of Fame, R wrestling is is a man maker, and and I'm glad to see that uh, you know it's been open uh, to women as well, uh, and it produces the intangibles, right? Uh, the life the life skills. Uh, and I think you know I, I can't tell you the number of times. Uh, you know, uh, as a mechanized commander driving over the berm in Saudi Arabia, going into Iraq, where, I mean, you know, you, you think about all the things, I mean, in, in a flash, it runs through your head about all the things that you've endured in your life, and can I deal with this? Or whether it's, uh, you know, you know, doing a combat parachute assault in Afghanistan, or, uh, you know, uh, patrolling the Hindu Kush mountain range up in Afghanistan, or parachuting in, in into Iraq in, again in 2003, you, you, you have those intangibles and, you know, you know, part of the problem, you know, going to Iowa is that Gable creates very, very unique people. Uh, and when you step out of the laboratory into the real world, uh, people are not, they, they, they don't know how to handle you uh, because you, you, you've been, you've been trained and in, in, in shaped to do things at a certain level. And people look at you like you're crazy, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and so, so it's a life skills. I mean, uh, I mean, it, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's just, it was just such a, such a unique place, but, uh, you know, anytime that I've ever been knocked down in my life, it was, it was, uh, my faith in wrestling. that got me back up on my feet. That's it. That's that, that wrestling mindset, so to speak, that develops.
And I got the book right here, the, the New Breed. I guess my screen's cutting out, but you guys are have, well, all over the book. But page 47, there's if we can see in there. There you are. Yeah. Great stuff. And that's excellent. But, but talk about your book. Uh, we started speaking about it before the call, Uncommon Bonds and your three principles of success, which I'm sure there's a lot built on top of that. Because we'd like to yeah. make sure a link in the, in the show notes and make sure everyone buys the book. Yeah, you know, I'll start out because it's actually something I, I was thinking about in, uh, I was a communications major uh, as an undergrad and I've, you know, living the story, you know, is, is one thing and then putting it on paper is another thing because then you got to go out and actually get all the, the real, uh, the real facts and the real stories and, and uh, I was finishing up at West Point, it was my final year at West Point and I reported to our colonel and he said, what are you going to do with your life? And I said, you know, I may, I've been accepted to Penn State to do my MBA, but I'm, I may, uh, I may delay it a year or so because I've got this project I wanted. And, he, you know, he got talking to me about it and the, the project was on common bonds. And I just written a new breed. And uh, so he talked to me about an hour. He goes, hey, Lou, he goes, you know, I, I love you like a son, but I'm telling you, you don't have enough life experience to write the book that you want. Because there'll be a day that you'll know you'll have the right life experience and you'll put it in the right frame and it will be natural in terms of when when you start thinking about this. And it actually was the year Steve retired from the military in 2010. Um, we started talking about stories and and it was about over a four year period. We, st we just started thinking about them and capturing them. And then in earnest, Steve, I think in Ed, about 2014, we started putting pen to paper and uh, uh, we published the book, um, I think, around uh, 2015, April of 2015, and 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 it's really meant it's really meant to to share, um, you know, some lessons. Is, and there's you know multiple lessons that uh, come from it. From you know, Steve mentioned this earlier. You know, iron sharpens iron. One man sharpens another. You know, Proverbs 27:17. Um, optimism that's the, your roots you got to be you got to be optimistic builds character steve just mentioned that that you come out of that room with intensity you come out of it with purpose and and you are um you know three or four you know years ahead in terms of mental um maturity than a lot of young men and women coming out of college um so there's lots of lots of good lessons in there the the ability to adapt i'll let ed and steve kind of chime in but that was really sort of the, the predicate to why uh, you know the book happened because at that time we also felt that there was a need in our nation for something positive that you know if you own it as I mentioned this earlier if you own it and you're willing to put the hard work in there's not a better country in the world in terms to uh, go down your journey seek what you want um, the only reason you don't get it is because you don't go after it and it's it's pretty pretty linear in my mind in terms of that but i'll let the brothers kind of add to it because we you know, we each had different aspects of it that we uh we're involved in and uh, you know we wanted different different things to come out of it so um uh, steve and ed if you guys have any thoughts on it yeah i think uh you know that the, the, you kind of touched on it at the end there lou you know it, it's about optimism man you, you live in the greatest country in the world you ought to be optimistic. And, you know, and ours is a story. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a story for, uh, for everybody, really. Uh, I mean, I think you can laugh and everybody, you know, we've gotten a lot of feedback of, about people who had shared experiences, but one of the, one of the things that was, was kind of unique with us and, in, in, in uh, that I think can help a lot of people is, is when you're homeless and you have nothing, uh, you can still, be very, very successful, but you got to work. You, you got, you got to work and you got to go after it. You can't quit, you know? And, uh, and, and so if, if you're willing to do it, uh, you, you can do it in this country. You know, you, you can live the American dream. You can be what you want to be uh, in, uh, you know, some of the countries I fought in, that is not the case. Uh, that is not the case. You cannot be what you want to be. You got to leave that country to be what you want to be. Uh, and so that's a, that's a tremendous gift. And we want to share the gift. You know, uh, we, we had, we had nothing. We lived in houses that didn't have running water. Uh, we would carry buckets of water into our house out of a, uh, you know, a, a little pipe that, uh, you know, uh, was a, a well that was drilled in our backyard. 
Uh, and you tried doing that in December in New Jersey with uh, two or three feet of snow. And that water's running out constantly. So it's, it's, it's like a little ice pond. Uh, and you're, you're carrying, you know, 50 pound uh, cast iron buckets in, into your home. So you have water, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that's a, it's, it's there for the taking. And, uh, you know, and, and we describe that in the book, uh, you know, uh, I think pretty well. And, uh, and I think in a humorous uh, way, my wife at, at times was, uh, was laughing hysterically and then she flipped the page and she was, she was crying, you know, with, you know, big alligator tears and that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, I think it's a book that resonates with people. You know, one the thing. thing, about, thing Go ahead. Thanks, yeah, Luke. The thing about the book is, as I look, as I read it, and then I thought about it, we didn't know what we didn't know. I mean, we didn't have experience to go on. We just, we were there. We had a situation. We had a goal in mind, and we did it. We didn't. In retrospect, we look back now and we say, "Yeah, we had it pretty bad." And yeah, you know, we, we worked hard. We had people that looked after us, our coaches, obviously mom and dad, uh, Ellen and Stephanie Tooley, and our, and, and our aunts and uncles and nieces and nephews and cousins and stuff that we, you know, we were part of the family. We, we felt connected, but we didn't know what we didn't have in the early time. And we just did our best. Our dad and our mom, they, they were simple folks. And you said, whatever you do, do your best. Whatever you do, be the best at it you can be. And, you know, that's, that's the mod, motto that we went by, you know, do your best. And we're very successful and we're happy about it. You know, sort of the paradox of, uh, of, of sport in life is the mental aspect. And it, it, we picked up on that pretty early, the, the, you know, the concept of being resilient, adaptive, and innovative. And a lot of people don't pick up on that earlier because they don't have they don't have the reason to, they, they've got everything they need. So they've never really been tested. And I, and I, to me, that's the thing, the greatest gift we've ever uh, received, I think, is that gift of, you know, hard knocks, because it, it created that sense that one, if you, you're a continuous learner, uh, you go out there and you make yourself better every day, and not just in sport, but everything you're doing. Uh, you know, I know all three of us have carried that on to our professional lives. We, you know, continue to read, we're avid learners and, uh, but that, that sense of mental aspect that sport brings to you is something that resonated with us because we're absolutely willing to put the hard work in. And, and then what most people don't do, Gene, and it's, it's a rare group of people that actually do, they actually believe, okay, I put the hard work in. And then you mentioned earlier before Ed, Ed and Steve got on the anxiety that people have. And I always felt through preparation, uh, which is that continuous learning, uh, to get better and better and better, that anxiety level should go down. And I would say all three of us did a pretty good job of, you know, you, you reach a level of confidence where it's not arrogance, but a level of confidence that, you know, uh, this is all mental and I've got them beat because I know, you know, no one's worked harder than us. And I know I can beat them on the mat if there's enough time. And that's the other predicate we always used to have and talk about is the only reason we got beat is because time ran out. I mean, it was that simple. You know, if you give us another three or four minutes, we'd win. And that's kind of the mindset we had. And we you know, just never give up. And uh, that mental agility, that mental resilience is, to me, that's, that's been the, probably the, the best guardrail I've had. And just, you know, if you believe it enough, um, you got family and, and obviously friends that want to want to support you. But um, you got to believe it. I mean, you know, but Steve always says, you know, take the next step. And uh, we got knocked down an awful lot of times, but just got up and took that next step, took a little coaching along with it. And, you know, some good things happened along the way. That's great. And as I look at the website here for the book, bannockpower3.com, that's the number three. Uh, I see the, the three pillars, faith, innovation, leadership. Like we said before, you need your daily fill, F-I-L. Faith. Well, right. So talk a little bit about, we hit on faith, we hit on leadership. Talk about innovation and how that's important. Yeah, so when, you, go, who, go ahead. Who Eddie. wants to go first, Steve? You, you go ahead. All right. I think when, when I got to Iowa, Robinson would take all the freshmen for about six months and train them on some basic things. And then Gable would kind of look at that mold of clay and 
kind of start fashioning it, fashioning it into a, 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 a pottery bot, a bottle or a pottery bowl. And Gable realized that, yeah, we needed to have similar things. And that's why Robinson taught us the fundamentals, how to sprawl, how to, how to shoot, how to set people up, how to finish in, how to get out of legs and so on. But Gable took it a step farther and said, okay, what does this individual wrestler need to do to get better? That's different than what everybody else needs. And he would focus on that for that wrestler and he'd help them. And that's the innovation that Louie talks about a lot. Gable and his coaches did a wonderful job of taking each wrestler and coaching each wrestler on an individual level. Yeah, they're part of a team, but they're also individuals in where one wrestler may be strong in one area, another wrestler may be weak in that area. So he would work together with those two wrestlers to help the weaker wrestler understand why the stronger wrestler is stronger in that area and what they needed to do to become strong themselves. And that was phenomenal. Case in point with me, Mike Mann, my, my senior year, would ride the ankles. Back then, they were allowed to ride the ankles. Well, he had Mike McGivern come in the room every day and ride me for 30 minutes like that. And I had to learn how to get out. So I was weak in that area. McGivern was strong. He taught me how to get out and how to get, how to get people that are hanging on the ankles away. It cost me a, a match in uh, Cal Poly. Rick Worrell did the same thing. And uh, he took me down and rode me out. And I couldn't get away because of the way that they were allowed to ride the ankles. Now you can't do that. You know, I, I look at uh, innovation from a learning standpoint. If you're if you're learning, you're living, right? Uh, and uh, you know, from and I go all the way back uh, uh, to our days when we were in seventh and eighth grade. As we mentioned, we 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 were uh, you know we were we didn't we didn't have a whole lot of money, and uh, but my dad my dad was a a, a a licensed electrician, plumber, and carpenter, and so we had lumber laying around, and Ed. Uh, being the mechanical engineer, you know, that he is, you know, uh, he, he got these uh, four by fours and, and uh, we, we built our own bench uh, and uh, went out to the junkyard, got about a six or seven foot uh, uh, one inch bar rolled steel, uh, brought that down. And that, that was our weightlifting bar. And then uh, my, my, our parents got us, uh, I think, uh, two or four uh, 50 pound, uh, or 25 pound. I can't remember what it was, but, uh, these discs, they're the cheapest discs you could buy. Right. And, uh, so we had our bench and we had that, we had those weights and, uh, you know, it, it, you know, we, we were, you know, seventh, eighth grade, we, we, after dinner, we'd go out in our little, uh, you know, step down area in the back of our house and we'd be banging on those weights. That's what we had. And, uh, and it was a tremendous amount of competition, uh, between the three of us and, and everything we did, we, we would compete walking to school who could walk to school the fastest. Uh, and that's no joke. Uh, but there was a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, uh competition in terms of who could lift them, uh, the most, who could run the fastest, do the most push ups, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and, and so, you know, building, you know, the point there on the innovation side is, uh, you know, uh, er early on, I mean, we just, you know, ha had to figure out a way to, uh, to do things and innovate because we didn't have the tools and we just didn't have, you know, universal gyms and things like that, that, you know, other people had. And, and that made us hard. I mean, we, we were, we, we were some, we were some tough kids because we, you know, we just, uh, you know, we, we would, we would work with each other and, and uh, with, you know, all the things that we had and, and it's continued on, you know, in, in, in life, whether it's, you know, in, in my life, uh, developing different things, you know, uh, for the army, um, that, were, that have been pretty innovative and things like that. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, you, you, you learn, you've got to innovate, you got to adapt, you got to, you, I mean, uh, you look at the exponential change that we're experiencing in the world today, if you're not, uh, learning and innovating, you're going to be left behind pretty darn quick. You know, a couple, a couple of things I think that uh, I really like the conversation. Ed, Ed mentioned, you know, he had to cover off on his, you know, ankles. And uh, I mean, the other thing Ed did is, you know, he meant that was a weakness he had. So he minimized that, but he harnessed, you know, really 
harness his strengths, the things he did better, and that's where he innovated. And your innovation is going to happen around the, the things that are your greatest strength. And if it's your if it's your greater weakness, don't make it a blind spot for you. Protect it. But you're always going to innovate around what you do better than somebody else. You know the the reality is Steve mentioned the word living. It's also survival. Uh, when I think of innovation, that ability to change, you know, how you are today, how you compete today to how you compete to tomorrow. You think about it, you, just from a business context, uh, in five years, 80% of the businesses that started fail, right? And one of the key reasons they they fail is they don't innovate, they don't change, they they don't adapt, they don't recognize their weaknesses, and at least, you know, uh, you know, like riding Ed's ankles. I mean, you got you got to address your weaknesses, but you're never going to win through your weaknesses. You're going to win through your strengths. And then when I think about innovation, that's how I think about it. Innovation also makes you relevant. Uh, it keeps you in the game. If you're doing that, uh, you know, you got greater odds of staying and winning and living and surviving. Yeah, you, you know, and just to, just to build on it uh, one one step further, I mean, the the, the, the learning systems that we have that are these hierarchical learning systems uh, are, are not competitive. Uh, I mean, it, you, so you, you have to have a, a, a flatter, more symbiotic uh, type learning system uh, where the system drives the change. Your, lear your learning is part of the system uh, and, and uh, the system creates the change. You're part of the change uh, and, and, uh, and there isn't one person guiding it. it the, the system is guiding it and the inputs in the system and how you're connected with the system. It's about the interrelationships, you know, in the system. And, uh, and that's probably been the biggest change over the last 30 years that we've experienced, you know, around the world is, is, is how, is, how do, how do we adapt our learning system uh, to innovate and maintain a competitive advantage? You know, the other, the other aspect of that, you know, I, I know some things that are going on um, where, typically around innovation, new product development, those sort of things, you normally put an investment of two or three or four years into it. And what, you know, what we've learned is let's fail quick. Um, let's, let's go at a faster pace, bring more people in, let's have greater feedback loops. Let's speed up that, that process to success, and, but fail, fail a lot more, get immediate feedback, and then go forward on that. And we've We've taken life cycles down, you know, from three years to you know six months in terms of that ability to, like I said earlier, remain relevant because some of the innovation we're doing uh, in the company that I'm with. You know, so in, in closing on this, the whole idea is that old adage, you know, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. You invent yep. new things because you have a need, you have a gap, you have a, a, a spot that you have to fill. And so necessity, to get that done, you have to come up with something. So you invent something, you innovate. That's excellent. Great stuff. Really great information there. I guess for the last segment of the show, let's go one brother to the next, to the next. Anything that you wanted to share, anything we didn't talk about, any other stories or any other thoughts that you maybe thought about pr preparing for the call? Uh, you know, I'll start out. I, I think, uh, you know, uh, you know, something, you know, I, I have young adults and, and uh, as children and, and uh, you know, things, you know, you know, something I told them is always do the next right thing. Right. You, you, you always you always do the next right thing. And then, uh, you know, it's uh, you, you become who you associate with. All right. So think about your, your network uh, and, and, and how uh, you, you can have. And, and again, it's it's kind of concentric rings uh, because th your network has got to do different things for you, uh, and uh, and so you you've got to understand. Uh, you know, I talk to my kids about this. Where do you want to be when you're 55, and how are you going to get there, uh, and who who's going to help you get there, uh, and, uh, and 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 what what does that pathway look like? How much does it cost? You know what what. Uh, you know, how do you need to innovate to get there uh, and, and uh, you know, things of that nature and, and, you know, find, you know, find the coaches and mentors uh, that, uh, that that can teach you uh, and, 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 and bring you along uh, and, and show you the, show you the way, you know, and I, you know, I'll just close on this, you know, one, one of the guys that, uh, you know, that, that we've had uh, experiences with, and, and I think, uh, you know, we mentioned our high school coaches and Mark Fowler in particular, 
but uh, Kirk Ferentz, the head coach at the University of Iowa, you know, we're all Iowa guys, and uh, we talk a lot about Gable. Uh, but, uh, you know, my experience interacting with, with Kirk Ferentz uh, over the years is, is that you, you really got to think about how you define the best, you know, college football coach uh, in the country. Uh, you know, my experience with, with Kirk is, is that, uh, you know, he, he, he brings boys in and makes men out of them. Not everybody enjoys the process. Uh, you know, when you're, you know, uh, whatever star recruit you are, and you're all that in a bag of chips and you show up at a big 10 program that, you know, uh, you know, every year and over the last 22 years has put a, uh, a number, a bunch of kids, young men into the NFL, given them that opportunity. Uh, you know, Kirk is one of those guys that uh, I, I think is a tremendous uh, role model uh, in, in uh, you know, his, his, uh, his EQ, his emotional intelligence is off the charts. And, uh, you know, he's somebody that I've learned a lot uh, from, uh, you know, interacting with him. Uh, and, and, you know, him and, you know, all the other, you know, uh, you know, great military officers and, and whatnot that I've seen. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, you know, thinking about what the next right thing is and, and, and you know, and, and how do you get there, I think is pretty, uh, is, is, is a pretty good starting point. That's awesome. Thank you very much, Steve. Ed, do you want to go next? Or. Sure. So I was 12 years old watching the 72 Olympic Games and I saw Gable win a gold, John and Ben Peterson win. John actually won a uh, silver and Ben won a gold. And I think Wayne Wells also won a gold at 63. So I wanted, I made my, my goal at that time watching that I was gonna be an Olympic champion someday. Fast forward 12 years, 84 Olympics, I win a gold medal. And it was an accomplishment of the goal. But then I turned around and coached after that to help others be able to go out and if they want to win a gold medal. So to me, there's more to just goals than goals, but a goal has a beginning and an end. A lot of people, what they call goals is really just a purpose or, or something they want to do a wish. It's not really a goal. I sat down when I was 12 years old, saw those wrestlers win gold medals, decided I was going to do that told my parents, told coaches, and 12 years later, I was able to do that. Now, I didn't do it on my own. I had a lot of people help me. So you got to get in the right environment. But I was able to accomplish that goal 12 years after I set it. That's phenomenal. Thank you, Ed. Yeah. So uh, again, Gene, thank you for having us. And I'll close with a couple of things, maybe kind of how I, I started, I think, in terms of just the, the concept around peer group. Uh, and there's an African saying that uh, we had in our book, um, to go fast, go alone, to go far, go together. And that peer group is, you know, my brothers and I largely through the years, it's, and we have wonderful te te uh, teammates that became part of that peer group. So I would say uh, environment matters, going together matters. And uh, that's made a world of difference because we've had mentors, sponsors, teammates, coaches, parents that collectively they were our village and they, they made a difference for us. And they enabled us to do a couple of things. I think they enabled us to mentally outwork everyone and, uh, and physically retool uh, because we had, you know, we had the right people guiding us uh, each and every day. And those examples that make, uh, make you become a man from a boy and Steve is right. Uh, you know, wrestling's one tough crucial in which uh, you pass through to manhood and, um, there's so many great life lessons that one gets from, from the sport, but uh, it's relationship. And that's one of the words we started out with in the beginning. It's if you're willing to have a relationship and, you know, work with each other as brothers, teammates, coaches, a community, there's lots of people that want to that care and want to help you. And, uh, and I would underscore that's really been our journey of that, you know, because we've been willing to lean into it, take the next step. Um, we've been the beneficiary of a lot of people that have wanted to help us through the years and, uh, we're so grateful that they have and uh, and wanted to give it back. And that's why we kind of wrote on common bonds in a way to to give it back. And so other people have sort of a hand or, you know, a guardrail where they can grab onto it because life is incredibly tough, as you know it. I mean, it, it can beat you up. And uh, but that that sense of, uh, 
you know, not being alone, being there with others, your brothers, you've got, you know, brothers, the brother thing's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty special, but the larger brother group is your peer group, right? And uh, like I said, don't go it alone. And uh, I think that's, that's a good, you know, just a good reminder in life. This, you know, this is meant to be a personal uh, relationship based uh, world and, uh, you know, let's go, let's go together and let's stop fighting and let's come together and, and do, do good things together. Thank you very much, Lou. Excellent, excellent, great show we had today. Everyone needs their daily fill. Faith, innovation, leadership, and that's what Uncommon Bonds is all about, a journey and optimism. I'll give the website one more time, Bannock Power of Three. That's the number three. So Bannock Power of Three.com. Are there any other websites or anything else that I should attach? You could always send it to me after too. That's you know the uh, the book is out on Amazon, so the link to the book it, it make it easier for people. But I think actually on our website you can click right on it. From my recollection. Yep, you uh, can click it on there, and there's a section about the brothers public speaking. Get the book today. So we want everyone to go there. Thank you very much. Excellent show. Great information. We'll get the show out. We'll send it over to you. God bless you all, and God bless your families. Thank you. Hey, thank, thank you. you. Thank Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Appreciate Have a good it. Weekend. You too. Bye -bye. Take care.